sugar industry really started in Trinidad around the year 1784. The very first sugar mill that was built in Trinidad was in 1787, and that was in the Digo Martin Valley. So Trinidad was, was, was a late entrant to sugar production. So it started under Room de St. Lawrence and those um, French refugees who were, were coming from the islands. And once the, the Haitian Revolution started late um, 18th century, you had uh, refugees from that area come to Trinidad also. Sugar development really took a great leap forward once the British took over. So we can say from the beginning of the 19th century, that is the period. And we can say that by 1901, there were something like 25 sugar estates. As it, as, as it came to a close, you had the centralization of factories. Um, a small number of, of sugar factories bought out the large number of sugar factories that there were. So that by 1950, instead of the 25 sugar estates that you had in 1901, by 1950, we had uh, boiled down to six sugar estates. By 1972, there are four sugar estates. By 1975, there is one sugar estate, and that is Carony, 1975 Limited. Well, the role of Tate & Lyle was very important because Tate & Lyle was an English firm that came to Trinidad and started their takeover of all of these many sugar estates in 1937. So the majority of the laboring population on these sugar plantations abandoned the sugar plantations and went off and formed their own villages and their own settlements. But not all of the Africans left the sugar plantations. A considerable number of Africans remained on the sugar plantations in Naparima, in Karani, in the very few sugar estates that still remain in the north, they remain in the, um, on, on, the, on the sugar plantations, but in high-skilled jobs. What happened after 1838, when the Africans um, abandoned the plantations, it's, that's the time that a number of experiments were made to bring alternative labor supplies. So the Indians were finally the best solution to this problem of producing labor on the sugar plantations. And therefore, after the Indians started coming here in 1845, they didn't try any other experiments, no other efforts to bring any other kind of people, because finally they had found um, the best kind of, of cultivators of sugar. The, the other very important factor that surely contributed to the closure of the sugar industry in 203 was, was political, political considerations. Well, the closure of the, of the sugar industry in 2003 really impacted it very negatively on a very important section of the, of the economy. 2003, you had 9,000 people direct, who were directly employed by Carney Limited. You have 6,000 um, sugar cane producers, cane farmers who are directly put out of employment. But you have to think of the dependence of, of, of these people, which, which would bring that population to about 30,000. But you also have to bear in mind the large number, the, I would say up to about 200,000 people in Carney and Naparima who had become dependent on the sugar industry for all kinds of services, all kinds of spin-offs that, that came from the sugar industry. This project to save the memory and to preserve the heritage of, of, of sugar in, in Trinidad. This was really a project undertaken, I would say, around 2008 at the, at, at, at the University of Trinidad and Tobago, in which the Academy, the Academy for the Arts, Letters and Humanities, the Academy, which at that time was led by Professor Kenneth Ramchan, the Academy worked out a, a, a project, a program in which we said we want to go and preserve this sugar heritage. And Professor Ramchand, to his great credit, was totally in support of it. And then Professor Ramchand went to the president of the University of Trinidad and Tobago, uh, who at that time was Professor Ken Julian. And again, to his credit, 
he, he strongly supported the activity. Formal declaration of the project without any formal opening of the project, we went around, myself and a number of my students, and collected all the, the sugar records which were in a very poor condition all over the country and then store it here in people's houses here in Brecon Castle. So that collection of records was perhaps the very first project that we, that we went and did unofficially and without any financial support because we considered that very urgent since so many records were, were spoiling.